it is my honor to introduce the chairperson for the cellular therapy working group dr claudio dufour sir is professor of medicine and hematology at university of buenos aires school of medicine argentina after receiving his medical degree from university of buenos aires and md internal medicine of uh, from the same university he has multiple publications in national and international journals he is a member of european hematology association american association of blood banks and international society of cellular therapy sir has special interest in stem cell transplantation cell therapies regenerative medicine multiple myeloma biology of plasma cells new drug development and special focus on pre and post grade educational activities sir has done short term visiting about fellow scholarship 2014 to develop skills in stem cell transplant and is an honorary collaborator at Asia, american association of blood banks he was the international cell therapy ambassador for latin america he is a certified cell therapy assessor iso 9001 internal auditor for bureau veritas argentina and also advisor in cell therapy in argentina i request you to say a few words sir thank you again well thank you for all of you for sharing today this webinar i appreciate a lot your Uh, activities working out together and of course my thanks to the main speakers and my colleague and friend natalia shoot from argentina thank you before moving on let me introduce you to the moderator for this webinar dr natalia shoot dr natalia is assistant professor in the department of internal medicine at the Instituto Universitario del Hospital Italiano di Buenos Aires please uh, pardon my english version of the spanish uh, she is board certified in internal medicine hematology and bone marrow transplantation and investigator in several clinical trials she is faculty of the hospital italiano di buenos aires and currently serves as attending physician and associate researcher in the hematology division She has participated in Ash Clinical Research and Training Institute for Latin America, where she currently works as senior faculty. She is in charge fellowship program in hematology at her center. Her research interests are multiple myeloma and malignant hematology. She has been a member of research council at the hospital, the same hospital she works at, and scientific and uh, and the scientific and research committee of Argentinian Society of Hematology. she is a member of international multiple myeloma working group we welcome you dr natalia thank you very much your spanish is quite good in fact so <laughs> oh yes thank it's you. a pleasure to be here with you <laughs> moving on uh, it's my privilege to introduce the first speaker of this webinar dr hind al humaidan Nam is the co-chair person for this working group of cell therapy of Asian Association of Transfusion Medicine. Nam is consultant hematopathology, director of blood bank, transfusion therapeutic affairs, donor services, and stem cell cord blood bank. King Faisal Specialist Hospital and Research Center, Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. She is the chairperson of Saudi Arabia chapter of Asian Association of Blood Banks. She is a fellow in transfusion medicine. from duke university medical center usa she is a fellow of royal college of pathologists of australasia she is american association of blood banks certified assessor since april 2001 ma'am is fact inspect inspector completed training course in may 2016 and she was instrumental in establishing the first national cord blood bank in saudi arabia in 2006 ma'am has various professional memberships and publication in the international journals and ma'am would be talking about introduction of car t cells with us over to you dr hind thank you very much dr akaj it's a pleasure to be here uh, dr choudhury the president of the atm and the the, the chair of the uh, cellular therapy group dr claudio we have two distinguished speakers today i was asked just to give a short uh, introduction about the subject which we are uh, really uh, happy and thrilled to present to you this afternoon so uh, i'm just giving an introduction about the subject i will just share my slides with you one moment
Can you see the slides? Can you see my screen? Yes, yes ma'am. Yeah. Okay. okay, so now CAR T cell, the future is now. Now we were very excited uh, about this type of um, revolutionary therapy for cancer, which we started in our center uh, a year back. And till now we did quite few patient uh, with CAR T cell. Now, the, the, chi the chimeric antigen receptor uh, or CAR T cell, it's a new dawn in the age of cancer therapy uh, and cancer immunotherapy. As you know, the traditional cancer therapy is surgery, uh, chemotherapy, ra radiotherapy, then came the immunoglobulins and the antibodies and so on. Uh, until this fascinating type of, um, of therapy or immune therapy, what we call adoptive cell transfer or uh, adoptive cell therapy came um, um, in, into reality for the last uh, four or five years. Uh, uh, special attention has been given to that, uh, this type of therapy after the American FDA approval. And, uh, and basically what uh, uh, CAR T cell therapy or chimeric, chimeric antigen receptor is the ability of genetic engineering to alter, uh, alter uh, to change the genome or alter the genome of the cells. Uh, specifically, we are talking about the immune cells, which is T cells against a cancer specific and producing uh, CARs or chimeric antigen receptors. So this is a revolutionary type of treatment in medicine, uh, which has gained interest in the last uh, few years. And all the um, cancer society, hematology society, transfusion is, is, is really fascinated and thrilled about this type of treatment, which is giving hope for patient, uh, especially those who have refractory disease or relapse, uh, who, have, uh, who have no way of survival apart from this type of therapy. So it is a form of adoptive cell transfer. Now the initial studies in this area has been going on for years, but the success in the recent clinical trials, which has gained attention, especially after the first patient, uh, Emily Whitney in the States, this have really, um, and you know, all the media coverage for this patient, this has really gained attention to this type of treatment. Then came the American FDA approval. And since the approval for a specific diseases, I will mention to you, uh, everybody now, all the centers all over the world is talking about CAR T cells. So in the body, we have inherent innate uh, as well as acquired anti-tumor immunity. And the malignancy happens when the tumor cells uh, overcome the immunity of the body. So this concept became the basis of the modern day today immuno-oncology, uh, including CAR T cells. So basically, this type of therapy involves collecting the immune cells from the body to treat cancer. And uh, so CAR T cell is a type of adoptive cell transfer and adoptive cell therapy. Uh, the CAR T cells are genetically engineered T cells using viruses, special lentiviruses, or which are introduced into the cells to produce on the, uh, on the surface of the T cells chimeric antigen receptors, which are specific against a pre-identified antigen, uh, which ideally should, uh, should be expressed on the tumor cells, not expressed on the body. Otherwise, there will be collateral damage of normal cells in the body. So the CD19 antigen uh, was the, the, the first antigen that the cars were produced against, and it, it targeted uh, the B cell malignancies, which um, have the CD19, like leukemias and lymphomas. We are talking about uh, acute lymphoblastic leukemia in particular and lymphomas in general. Now, there were several generation of cars, uh, the first generation, second and third, the first generation of CARs, it had the ability to target the tumor. However, the cells don't proliferate and they don't persist in the circulation. They die very quickly. Then came the second generation CARs where there is a cost to military molecule, the 41BB and the CD3 Sigma, which it enables the CARs to survive in the circulation and proliferate. And then the third generation CARs. So basically what happens uh, when, when you have a, a CAR T cell therapy and you select a patient, we collect these T cells via leukophoresis uh, 
Then the cells will undergo selection, activation, then the important step of expressing the cars using a lentivirus or a retrovirus vector, and then expansion of these cells and infusing the cells back to the patient after giving the patient uh, chemotherapy causing lymphopenia. So it starts with the leukophoresis step, uh, then the, the, uh, the introduction, then the selection, introduction of the lentivirus and proliferation of the cells, infusing cells back to the patient to induce remission. Now, the, the, uh, the, the CAR T cells, when they are infused back to the patients, they target the tumor cells which bear the specific antigen. And as I told you, B cells express CD19, 20, 22. So CD19 CARs were, uh, uh, were the first CARs to be developed, although there is more and more chimeric antigen receptors are coming with uh, more clinical trials. And, uh, but, but so far, the CD19 is a big success. Uh, so it is most widely used now in several clinical trials all over the world. So basically, the CAR T cells identify the cancer cells, then they destroy, they link themselves to the cancer cells without going through the major histocompatibility complex. Uh, and uh, causing um, um, uh, killing of the cells and uh, um, uh, producing uh, remission in these patients. The first FDA approved indication came with the commercial Camraya. It was approved in August 2017. It was used for precursor B cell ALL in children and adults less than 25 years old. Then a few, almost a year after back, the Camraya was also uh, FDA approved for lymphoma, diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, not otherwise uh, categorized or high-grade uh, high B-cell lymphoma, and diffuse large B-cell lymphoma arising from molecular lymphoma. Now, Camraya consists of autologous T-cells collected by pharesis, genetically modified to express these scars uh, and, and giving back to the patient. And then at the same year, another company produced another FDA approved product called the Iscarta. This is used for, uh, for lymphoma in, in, uh, uh, in particular. So it is used for diffuse, um, for refractory or relapse, diffuse large B cell lymphoma uh, or primary with standard large B cell lymphoma, high grade B cell lymphoma, and diffuse large B cell lymphoma arising from follicular lymphoma. This got the FDA approval in October 2000. 17. Now, as we speak, there are hundreds of clinical trials all, of, all over the world um, uh, for CAR T cells. And uh, recently, the CAR T cells for multiple myeloma got the approval. That's, that's the latest CARs now we have. So we have ALL, lymphoma, and multiple myeloma now. And in the future, I think more and more uh, CARs are coming. The, still, the drawback is the, the expense. It is very expensive procedure. Even in our center, which, which, which somehow, I mean, the, the expense was not an issue before, uh, to approve this type of therapy was very, very difficult. So, so far, I think it is the most expensive treatment to date. But uh, in the future, probably this type of treatment will be um, available more if the, if the cost is, uh, is reduced. Thank you very much. Uh, that's just a short introduction. And we are excited to hear our two international speakers. Uh, so we can, uh, I, I will stop sharing now and we'll go to the first speaker. Um, should I introduce the first speaker, Dr. So it is, uh, it is my uh, pleasure to introduce Dr. Kyle Annan as uh, our first international speaker. She's the medical director of the transfusion services in Children's Hospital in Colorado, USA. She's associate professor of pathology at the, at the university uh, and uh, US board certified. Uh, she will be talking to us the title of her talk. I can't see it in front of me. Um, I will share with you from my mobile phone. Dr. Kyle will be talking about yeah. pediatric, pediatric yeah. infections. Yeah, big pediatric challenges in little patients. Yes, big challenges for little patients. Please, Dr. Kyle, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Can everyone hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Great. All right, just give me a moment to open up my slides.
All right, and can everyone see my screen? Okay, great. Yes, Dr. Kyle. All right, thank you so much for inviting me uh, today. Uh, good afternoon to many of you, or good morning. It's actually really early for me, um, but it's a pleasure to be here. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the Children's Hospital Colorado experience with CAR-T therapy. Uh, so Children's Hospital Colorado, just to give you a little bit of background, um, we are a top 10 children's hospital in according to the US News and World Report best hospital ranking. We actually got six again this year. They just announced it. So we're the sixth best in the country. Um, it's always a big deal in my hospital. They always give us free cookies. Um, and we are a major children's hospital for uh, seven states. So we're the only children's hospital or only significant children's hospital um, for states like Wyoming, Idaho, um, uh, Montana, I mean, we, we have kids flown in from all over for treatment. Uh, we are a level one trauma center with 444 beds and we have all subspecialties, including uh, organ transplant, neurosurgery, et cetera. Um, our therapeutic apheresis department is um, a really nice model. It's actually managed through the laboratory and it's uh, entirely uh, contained within itself. So the apheresis department, we're the only group that offers apheresis in the entire hospital. So every kind of apheresis procedure that is done is within my group. I know some other hospitals or facilities may have like ne ne uh, ne nephrology would run plasma exchange and cardiology might run LDL apheresis. But um, as medical director for the apheresis service, I oversee all apheresis for the facility. Um, and then we have a clinical program coordinator who is an RN and then we have uh, three apheresis nurses um, and then a HEMA practitioner. Um, and that is a um, very uh, old method of certification specifically for apheresis. You don't see that uh, certification very often. Um, and I can tell you that it's old enough that she's been in practice pretty much my entire life. So anyway, um, I have a really, really great team and I'm really grateful for them. So um, I won't belabor this because we already had that excellent introduction to what is CAR-T therapy. Um, chim chimeric antigen receptor is a form of adoptive cellular therapy. It uses a graft versus cancer effect to defeat the tumor. Um, it involves genetic modification of T cells to recognize the tumor antigen. And the modified cells are reinfused. And as was mentioned, they have to have a target in order to multiply in the patient. And one of the really nice things about this therapy is that after it's infused and it proliferates and attacks the cells, once are the cancer cells, once there's no more detectable cancer cells, the therapy dies out and it goes away. So there should be no residual um, long-term effects. And of course, we don't know that for sure yet, um, but uh, that is at least the theory. Um, so, of course, therapeutic apheresis is a critical step in the process, and one of the really funny things about uh, this in particular is that if you look at many of the clinical trials throughout the United States and the world, and there are several papers that have been written on this, um, they have a varying degree of mentioning apheresis as a critical step in the process. Some of them don't mention apheresis at all. Some of them will have um, quite detailed um, instructions and criteria for apheresis, um, and then some, uh, many of them are somewhere in between. Between. So uh, apheresis or leukodepletion or leukophoresis, depending on how you like to say it, um, allows for the targeted collection of the patient's white blood cells. The patient is connected to the apheresis apheresis machine via two intravenous lines. Uh, here at Children's, we will very often do two pick lines. So they're single, um, they're central lines that go in the upper arm on both sides. Um, and so you have one line for the draw and one line for the return. Um, so you're as the patient is essentially attached to this large circuit. Um, and then the blood is incrementally removed, uh, centrifuged, and then the desired layer is removed and the remainder is returned to the patient. Now this process will usually require multiple cycles or blood volumes. Um, and depending on the size of the patient and um, some of the other factors, this this may take um, four to six hours. Um, we've had some very tiny babies that we've treated that have had very high cell counts um, and we've been able to be done in half an hour. Um, but the vast majority of patients I would say are probably between four and six hours. Um, and I wanted to mention uh, some of the interesting things we've learned about our collection parameters over the years and experimenting with um, you know, optimizing our ability to target these different cells. So uh, we do use the Spectra Optio, which is uh, by Terumo BCT out of Japan. Um, and we were actually able to build a, a rough estimator or a prediction model to develop, uh, to uh, 
estimate how many total blood volumes we would need uh, in order to get the CD3 goal for these patients. And our CD3 base collection efficiency is actually very good. Um, it's about 58.6% um, on average. So that, that is better than most of the literature reports for collection efficiency. Um, and we typically are processing, um, our standard is three blood volumes. Uh, we can sometimes go a little bit higher. Uh, basically for CAR T therapy, we will very rarely uh, vary from the uh, total blood volumes. Our standard is three, and we will almost always just collect three, no matter what the prediction algorithm says. Um, the prediction algorithm is most useful if we don't think we're gonna get it in one day, because then we can make plans to have a second day of collection. Um, although the vast majority of our patients do successfully collect in one day, it's pretty unusual to need a second day for CAR-T therapy collection. Our average total blood volume is uh, 3.1 total blood volumes. Um, and we uh, have had some challenges, but we managed to maximize our AC infusion rate um, to uh, process these total blood volumes more quickly. Um, and we've actually developed improved collection efficiency, efficiency by using the continuous mononuclear cell collection um, mode in uh, Spectra Optia. Um, and what that is, is essentially the cells are siphoned off of the um, of the uh, centrifuge and set, set, uh, immediately sent to the collection bag throughout the process, uh, as opposed to uh, the mononuclear cell collection, which is an intermittent process where there are small pauses to collect the cells in a chamber and then the chamber moves the cells into the collection bag. Um, and I wanted to note, I thought this was a really nice um, thing to share. So what one of the things that we have learned is that our MNC target, so this is our uh, CD34 uh, color target. So when we're collecting a traditional peripheral blood stem cell, we like to go between color three and four on this diagram. Um, we often will say the red or the better. Um, so uh, we will trend towards four, but we have found that we get dramatically improved collection efficiency for the CAR teeth targets if we actually go more towards this uh, peach color here in two. Um, so that has actually helped us to uh, really improve our collection efficiency and I wanted to make sure I shared that. Um, so uh, we have performed 49 CAR-T collections to date. Now these are not all Kimraya um, or the Novartis product. Um, we uh, are participating in various randomized controlled trials as was already mentioned. Um, and so we have started actually doing some other um, CAR-T markers. I know we have some on-site development of uh, CD, some additional CD19, CD22 um, and some other ones. Um, so I wanted to show you, this is our historical trends uh, specific for Children's Hospital Colorado. And I just wanted to show you how uh, stem cell therapy is, is, or sorry, CAR T therapy is definitely growing over the years. Um, as you can see back in 2016, these two were actually participating in the original uh, clinical trials for the Kimraya products. So we would collect on site and then we had to send them to the main hospital that was doing the processing, which was CHOP, uh, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Um, and then after it was approved, of course, it's taken off. And uh, I do think uh, based on our numbers so far in 2020, um, or so that are our numbers for 2021, that we probably will um, exceed our uh, record year so far, which was 2018. Um, so now I just have a few cases and some uh, interesting articles to present. Um, I don't want to belabor them too much. Um, so case number one, um, this is my longest case. Uh, we have a 21-year-old female with relapsed Philadelphia chromosome um, and acute lymphocytic leukemia. Um, she has an isolated CNS relapse. Um, and her CD3 peripheral is, uh, was 1,379, so a good initial CD3 number. Uh, we began her collection routinely with the inlet citrate ratio of 12 to 1. Um, however, about 50 minutes remaining of her collection, the Optia had repeat return and collect alarms. We could just could not get these alarms to improve. Um, and so we actually did re, uh, reduce our citrate ratio down to 8.1, um, or sorry, 8 to 1, which is pretty low for us. That's about as low as we ever go. Um, that was kind of the bottom of our comfort level. Um, but the alarms persisted, and we actually found a big clot in the collection bag. Um, so at that point, we had to stop the uh, procedure. Um, we also found a clot developed in the return line. So especially for patient safety, we stopped. Um, and we did end up stopping the procedure. Um, however, because this was a larger patient, uh, she did not require a transfusion, um, despite the loss of the um, 
um, blood in the optio circuit. Um, and I can show you here that this is actually what her flow looked like. So you can see over here, this is, would be our normal. We have good flow with no clumping. Sorry, this isn't in color, uh, but you can see a really nice, consistent, even um, diagram here. And then we have our bad flow with clumping. You can obviously see that compared to this, that this is pretty terrible. Um, so of course we were unable to continue the procedure. Now uh, we were able to pr process 2.5 blood volumes for this patient. Um, her ionized calcium, we collect ionized calcium at the beginning, uh, middle and end of the procedure and then as necessary, depending on if there's any patient symptoms. Um, and so you can see here her ionized calcium uh, remained within normal range. Um, and her final yield was well above target. So target for CD3 is 1.0 E9 uh, per kilogram. Um, and the total nucleated cell count goal is 2.0 E9 uh, per kilogram. So we well exceeded these goals um, and everything should have been great. Except that uh, we had to collect her again 10 days later. And the reason for this is because uh, once the product got to Novartis for processing, uh, they discovered a crack in the bag. And so the entire product could not be used and had to be thrown out. Um, this happens to us very rarely. Um, it has happened a couple of times. Uh, but yeah, unfortunately, this patient had to come back, go through the whole thing over again, get new lines, everything. So this time our CD3 peripheral absolute was... It happened to us too. Same, same. Crack. Yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, CD3 peripheral absolute was um, just over a thousand, so it was still good. We this time we started knowing she clotted so much last time. Um, we started with a citrate ratio of eight to one, and as I said before, normally we start twelve to one. Um, and so three point five hours into the procedure, she developed clotting in the circuit again. Um, and so this time we actually increased our ratio to six to one. And you know, for some of you that may not be a big deal or maybe many of you are used to this, but for us at a pediatric facility, we very rarely will drop this low. This was, this was a little out of our comfort zone, um, but actually the patient did fine. Um, we were able to finish the procedure. Um, and as I can show you here, interestingly, um, despite increasing that citrate ratio, her ionized calcium remained very stable throughout the procedure. We did not need to increase her calcium infusion and she did not develop any symptoms. Um, and so the final yield for her uh, was actually very good. Um, and this time the product was able to be processed. There wasn't, there wasn't any problems. Um, and she's actually, this was a couple of years ago and she's doing very well. Um, so clumping and citrate is one of our biggest challenges in pediatric apheresis. Um, and this is because of course, we wanna make sure that we have a, a, a good amount of citrate in order to prevent uh, clumping and to uh, promote good flow. Um, however, smaller patients, we have to run more slowly. Um, and then of course, smaller patients may be more sensitive to citrate. So generally, this is of course not by any means a rule, but in general, we assume that if you're about 10 kilograms, you're gonna run at about 10 mils per minute. Um, up to 50 kilograms, you can run usually even much faster than 50 mils per minute. But this is kind of our rule of thumb for when we're planning a procedure as to how fast we expect to be able to go for a patient. Um, so citrate-based anticoagulation is uh, very common for any type of peripheral blood stem cell collection. Um, and as you know, it lowers free calcium, um, which inhibits the co coagulation cascade. Um, and then citrate anticoagulation is transient. So as long as the patient has a normal functioning liver, um, as soon as that citrate re-enters the patient, um, it's essentially going to be deactivated using the calcium in the patient's blood. However, of course, that can cause citrate toxicity, um, as well as hypocalcemia. Um, so we prevent hypocalcemia by providing IV calcium supplementation. Um, other places may uh, prefer oral supplementation. Um, you can also, of course, reduce the citrate load, and um, you can also do a combination of citrate and heparin, or even all heparin, depending on your procedure, um, in order to avoid citrate altogether. And different places have different procedures. Uh, we only use citrate. We don't use heparin. Um, and then, of course, hypomagnesemia and hypokalemia may also occur, although I think um, certainly at my facility, we don't pay quite as much attention to those electrolytes, which I thought was interesting. So this is a study from uh, 2014 published in the Journal of Clinical Aphresis, um, and this was actually an international study 
that I believe it was over 150 countries responded. Now, the majority of the responses, I think over 80 responses were from the United States. Um, but this just kind of shows you the distribution of the different kinds of anticoagulation that's used in a stem cell collection. Um, so as you can see, you know, the majority of places do use just citrate, the same as Children's Hospital Colorado. We did actually participate in this survey. Um, but you can see here that many places will use an ACDA heparin combo or heparin only. Um, and then calcium and magnesium practices. This is a little survey we did ourselves when we were trying to figure out what people were using uh, between calcium chloride and calcium gluconate and if they were always routinely giving it IV or if it was only as needed. Um, and this is because uh, most pediatric facilities uh, giving IV calcium or some kind of calcium supplementation during the procedure is pretty standard of care. A lot of these kids can't tell us if they're having symptoms. I mean, if you're four years old, you're not gonna be able to say like, oh, I have paresthesias. Um, you might just say something's wrong. Um, and certainly a baby can't tell us at all. Um, so calcium dosing, uh, we did find varies across the different uh, children's facilities in the United States. Um, and routine magnesium supplementation, which was another uh, question we had, uh, is not very common. And so you can see here that about half the, half the facilities um, are using calcium chloride and about half the facilities are using calcium gluconate. Now it's interesting, at our facility, we started out with calcium gluconate, um, but then there was a calcium gluconate shortage. And so we switched to calcium chloride um, because as I mentioned, the majority of our uh, line infusions or our calcium infusions were through those PIC lines, which are central lines. Um, so that worked fine, but we've recently started using a new uh, catheter called the Power Wand, and it is a midline IV catheter that can be left in for 29 days. Uh, we're only using it outpatient, um, but because it's an IV, you can't uh, peripheral IV. You cannot use calcium chloride because of the risk of extravasation. Um, and we actually had an accidental infusion of calcium chloride into one of these. Um, what right when we started? The patient was fine. Fortunately, there weren't any complications, um, but that made us very concerned. And so at that point, we switched back to calcium gluconate. And so now we're routinely using calcium gluconate. If I had to pick between the two, I prefer chloride because it has better absorption, um, but uh, that's where we're at. Um, and so I did want to also mention that um, routine uh, calcium supplementation is used the most for cellular therapy. Um, so I don't want to go through this one in too much detail. This is actually an adult study, um, but I thought it was really interesting to address hypokalemia and hypomagnesemia following peripheral stem cell collection. Um, and so this was actually a prospective study um, with a historical arm and then a prospective arm. And they looked at 136 patients. And again, these were peripheral blood stem cell, um, so not CAR-T specifically. Um, and basically, patients were told to eat a calcium-rich meal, and then they, uh, had a, they used uh, ACDA in order to um, do the collections. Now, what was interesting about the study was the historical arm was on the spectra, the old machine, um, and then the uh, prospective arm was on the Optia. And as you can see from these differences in numbers, um, they actually had a lower citrate infusion and fewer blood volumes processed on the Optia. So that ultimately may have ended up confounding their results. So all patients did uh, receive an IV infusion of calcium gluconate and venous blood samples were collected for magnesium and potassium pre and post. Um, so prevention of hypokalemia and hypomagnesemia, as I said, um, the potassium in the historic cohort, so no supplementation of potassium or magnesium, the historic cohort found that potassium declined significantly. And what was interesting was the greatest decline in potassium was people who started with high potassium. So they had the greatest decline. Um, and then people who started with lower potassium tended to stay more stable. I thought that was kind of unusual. Um, and they, they did find that if they then gave oral potassium supplementation, it did reduce the loss, but it was not statistically significant. So 93% of these subjects had a post uh, peripheral blood stem cell uh, potassium level that was below the low end of the reference range. Um, and they, so they, what they did was they developed a goal of maintaining these patients above a minimum of three millimoles per liter with supplementation if they were starting um, less than four. And so magnesium was similar uh, magnesium remained static in patients who were supplemented ahead of time, um, but again, it declined significantly in those who were not given any kind of supplementation. And it, again, it was more pronounced if you started out high, um, you had a more dramatic drop. 
So for the uh, prospective arm, so that was the historic arm. So they basically just monitored everybody. And so for the prospective arm, they uh, routinely gave potassium and magnesium uh, prophylaxis and oral solution prior to the start of the procedure. And so for this, for this one, they did find there was a, a, dec a decrease in the loss of potassium, unsurprisingly, um, compared to the historic the historic cohort. However, they did mention that those changes in Optia may have been a uh, confounder. Um, and then magnesium, same thing, about 93% of patients who received the magnesium uh, oral solution, um, they did have an improvement in their plasma magnesium compared to the historic cohort. Um, so overall, the declines were buffered by oral prophylaxis. So I wanted to share this because magnesium um, and potassium supplementation is not something I follow too closely um, as far as electrolytes go in my practice. Um, but I thought it was an interesting study, and I, I just wanted to put this out there. Now, one of the things that I wanted to point out was there were no adverse events reported in the historic group. Um, and while in theory, you know, electrolyte disturbances, potassium in particular, can cause, uh, you know, cardiac arrhythmias, calcium can cause seizures, um, certainly you can have significant effects, and higher amounts of citrate, of course, can cause a metabolic acidosis. Um, we, you know, really apheresis tends to be a very safe procedure and these kinds of complications are very rare. So is going through this effort to um, give prophylaxis ahead of time worthwhile? So I guess that's still kind of the question. So let's go on to our next case. Um, this is a much shorter case. So uh, case number two, we had a four-year-old female with relapsed ALL, status post a haplo BMT. So this is a previously transplanted patient. Um, and upon arrival to apheresis, she was noted to have a macular pink rash on her stomach and extremities and a low grade fever. Um, and consultation with the BMT provider raised concerns for graft versus host disease. So the patient had just stopped steroids and may have been in rebound phenomenon from that. Um, she had some history of some allergies and some other things. So we weren't entirely sure what was going on. But what's really important about this case is that GVHD is a contraindication for CAR-T. Obviously, if you're collecting lymphocytes from a patient and they're going to be manufactured into a cancer fighting process, you don't want to reinfuse that into a patient if part of those lymphocytes are actually attacking the patient, right? So it is a contraindication. Um, and so we did actually contact Novartis and they recommended delaying the procedure. Um, so the patient was rescheduled with a successful collection um, after her symptoms resolved. And we did determine that it was not graft versus host disease. So this is a direct from the uh, package insert for Kimraya. Um, and as you can see, uh, the, um, there are many uh, you know, significant reasons why you may want to delay collection. Um, some of the big ones, of course, are going to be uncontrolled infection, um, but active graft, graft versus host disease is one of the things where you should uh, definitely contact the facility before you do the, uh, before you do the collection. Um, so one of the things uh, that may have caused this patient's rash was uh, their me the medical washout, the medication washout prior to the uh, CAR-T collection. And as you can see, there's a long process of making sure that you have stopped all of these medications prior to CAR-T to make sure that they don't uh, impact the product. Um, so as you can see here, therapeutic do doses of steroids, which was what happened to our patient, has to be stopped three days prior to the procedure. Um, and of course, this timing uh, causes a lot of challenges with our protocol. Now, you might be surprised to learn that uh, for a while, we were getting very last minute requests for CAR-T. And I mean two days. They'd say, hey, we want to collect CAR-T on Friday, and it would be Wednesday. And uh, so we had some challenges figuring that out. One of them, as was previously mentioned, is this product is very expensive. In the United States, it's about $250,000 for this product. Um, and that does include all the rest of the stuff. So, I mean, a bone marrow transplant already costs a million dollars in the United States. So um, this can be uh, very financially burdensome. And so we would get the request. And sometimes these patients didn't even have their insurance approval in order to uh, proceed with the procedure yet. Um, and of course, we have all of our testing requirements. We would have to scramble and do the uh, pre-testing requirements, get the infectious disease testing, et cetera. Um, we'd have to arrange for access in some of these patients. Some of them are very small and we'd have to, um, they'd have to have sedation in order to have lines placed. Um, and then of course, we wanna be very aware overall for patient safety. 
Um, so this is a paper uh, I wanted to go through, and I, I know I want to make sure there's plenty of time for the last speaker, so I'm going to not belabor it too much. Um, but uh, this is one of those papers. Do you ever read a paper and think, wow, why didn't I write that one? Um, so this paper, I think, really encompasses a very similar process to what we do at Children's. And I thought it was a really nice summary of CAR-T um, collection for apheresis. Um, so this was published by a German group. Um, and they, this is a report of 46 apheresis patients, uh, or apheresis collections in 36 patients. Um, and so uh, they looked at CAR, CD CAR, uh, this was for CD19 CAR-T, so they didn't have any re other research protocols. This was strictly for the Kimraya product. And by the way, I'm not advertising Kimraya with this. I'm just saying Kimraya because I have no idea how to say this word. So I'm not even going to try. Um, so most common, the most common diagnosis for this patient group was uh, refractory ALL. And uh, pre apheresis T cell concentrations were used to calculate uh, the apheresis target volume. Um, they're li they limited it to two total blood volumes, so 300 minutes total duration. If you'll remember at my facility, we go for a three total blood volume procedure. Um, they did have a maximum 15% out of plasma volume. And the collection, they reported a collection efficiency of 40%. So if you remember, our collection act efficiency is actually a little bit better. Um, and they developed a correlation for collection um, of the circulating MNC in the blood compared to the apheresis product of a uh, 0.97. Um, so I thought that was interesting. They kind of developed this rough correlation for how much they could predict that they would get. Um, now they routinely used a Hickman dual lumen catheter um, and they, uh, they did also note that one of their big challenges uh, was the toler citrate tolerance um, for flow rates. Um, and they actually did also have a heparin protocol. So they had an ACDA heparin combo protocol um, that they used in their small patients. And so they actually, this is another thing I thought was really interesting about this particular group, was depending on the size of the patient, um, they actually would use either the continuous mononuclear cell collection or the, mon the intermittent mononuclear cell collection. Um, and that was based on the patient size and the flow rates. Um, they did note that uh, for they felt they got, I think it was they got better uh, results from MNC as opposed to CMNC, but they had to use CMNC for very small patients, particularly those around 10 kilograms, um, because that was the only thing that would allow the flow rate to be low enough and still manage the collection. You'll remember that we just used CMNC. Um, and so they had 28 patients that had undergone previous allogeneic bone marrow transplant. Um, and 33 of these patients underwent apheresis, 13 female and 20 male. And of 46 procedures, 23 patients only needed one collection. Um, so seven patients required repeat collections weeks or months later due to a production failure. Um, so we're not the only ones who have production failures as, as you mentioned. Um, and then the median age was 13, but I mean, these numbers, look at this, one to 33 years, eight to 84 kilograms. And we've actually done a 5.6 kilogram patient, by the way, I think that's our smallest. Um, and then the median height was uh, 76, 26 centimeters. So as you can see, huge variation in size, which is what you'd expect for a pediatric population. Um, so I don't think median is very meaningful in this particular scenario. Um, so for weight under 30 kilograms um, or anemia, uh, they did use a blood prime, which is where you take a unit of donated blood and then pre-fill the machine uh, to provide a buffer from um, that, vo that volume that would need to be removed from the patient. Very small patients cannot tolerate the amount that would need to be removed to go into the circuit. Um, the MNC collection kit for Optia has a very large uh, extracorporeal volume. It's about 300 milliliters. Um, and so obviously in a very small child, they're just not gonna be able to tolerate that. That might be half their blood volume, you know, or a good third of their blood volume. So we, uh, we do very often also use a, a red cell prime. Um, and in slightly larger kids, we think can tolerate it, we may use an albumin prime. Um, but this is also a practice that we do. Um, the units were irradiated and cross-matched uh, compatible or negative. Um, and children under 30 kilograms uh, received a potassium calcium drip. Um, as I mentioned, we routinely give calcium no matter the uh, age or size. Um, and then 28 patients did end up receiving back their uh, Kim Raya product uh, with uh, 24 uh, in remission on day 28 post CAR T infusion. And they did not report any significant adverse events.
which I think is you know fairly common. I, I'm very fortunate in that I think that adverse events are pretty rare for apheresis uh, collections in general. So this is my last case and I'm almost done. Uh, this is another very short one. I just thought this was really interesting. And this was very recent. I think uh, we actually just had this young man uh, last week actually. Um, so this was an eight-year-old male with an acute lymphoblastic leukemia with CNS relapse. Um, and he's eligible for a research CAR-T therapy. So this patient did not undergo the Novartis protocol. He actually uh, was um, under a, a research protocol that's being performed on site at Children's Hospital Colorado. Um, so the successful, successful first, I'm sorry, the successful first CAR-T collection um, and infusion, everything went fine. Um, and that what was interesting though was um, one month after this CAR T infusion, the bone marrow aspirate showed 10% hematogones. And so then in consulting with the research team, they felt that it was appropriate to repeat the CAR T collection um, under the same research protocol. So that's the one that we just completed last week. Um, so we've successfully uh, collected the second CAR-T. Um, and can I tell you, by the way, that this young man, he had a CNS relapse. You would not know he was sick at all. He is the most energetic, normal, uh, he's now nine, nine-year-old that I have had as a patient in a while. It was, it was actually kind of nice to have a healthy kid um, or, you know, an outwardly appearing healthy kid um, since, you know, I have so many kids that are just so tragically sick. Um, so overall, you know, there certainly are a lot of challenges uh, for CAR-T in general and definitely for pediatrics. Um, one thing that I didn't get into was that, um, and this may have been what happened in this previous patient, loss of CD19 can reduce the effectiveness and create resistance to CAR-T. Um, the presence of sepsis, graft versus host disease, or et cetera, can prevent or delay our collection. Um, we often use this for rescue therapy or as a bridge to transplant. So um, although it's been very successful um, and a very good product, um, we haven't really been able to use it alone, I think, which would be ideal, especially considering the cost. Um, and as I said, it's very, very expensive. Um, you know, here in the United States, I uh, will say that we have amazing technology and kind of terrible healthcare. Um, so, um, and that's just my opinion. I'm sure there's people who would disagree with me, but um, the new US News and World Report also agrees with me. Um, so we have a lot of challenges with, um, you know, patients being able to afford their treatment with insurance coverage. Um, that aspect of our healthcare is um, very, uh, poorly integrated and uh, patchy. So that could be a big challenge for some of these kids. Um, and then line placement, um, as I mentioned, these patients can be very, very small. Some of them will have terrible veins. Some of these kids have been through three uh, cycles of chemotherapy. Um, and so, you know, they have tiny veins and they're already sclerotic. Um, and we're often asked why we can't use, for example, an existing port, right? Why stick these kids again? Why give them another line? But of course, it depends on the flow rate um, that's available. And most of these kids' ports just will not support the flow rates we need in apheresis. Um, and we are participating in multiple research goals. So the therapy goals can vary, the sequence can vary. Um, so it's getting a little bit challenging to keep track of all of these differences, but I'm also really grateful to be participating in, you know, cutting edge research, especially in the area of cellular therapy. Um, so that's all I have. Um, I want to make sure I say a thank you to my uh, clinical practice manager, Eileen Schwartz, who helped me with some of the data slides at the beginning of the talk. Um, and this is my apheresis team. Now, I don't have a bunch of children on my team. Um, two of my uh, colleagues did not want to put pictures of themselves up, so they sent me pictures of their children instead. Aren't they cute? Um, and then, uh, of course, the cutest one of all, in my opinion, is my cat. So um, I understand questions will be held to the end of the webinar. So that's all I have to say for now. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay. And so thank you all the speakers for the outstanding presentations. And we are going to open now the question and answer session. And we do have a lot of questions. That's very good because it means that the, the audience was very interested in this topic. And I'm going to start with our first speaker, with um, maybe uh, in all our countries, we're just starting with this kind of therapies. We're just starting doing CAR T cell trials or preparing our center for doing that. So uh, what do you think are 
important in order to prepare the center for this therapy or our team for this center, which are the, the most important things to take into account when facing this future. The future is now, you said. So uh, how do we prepare our centers for this new therapeutics and for, for the future? So. Dr. Bean, are you there? I think Dr. Hind had some connection issues. Okay, <laughs> so uh, Dr. Kyle, can you answer this question about it? I mean, if you are going just to start with this CAR T cell therapies, that's maybe the reality in most of the centers in Latin America and Asia, uh, which things are you going to consider as priorities in order to deliver these therapies safely? Um, that's a great question. Um, you know, I think one of the big challenges is, I mean, the, the first step is going to make sure that um, you have an arrangement with the manufacturer. Um, now, that's going to be um, probably the first step and, and probably the easiest introduction into CAR-T would be to participate through the, you know, previously FDA approved program. Um, and they have a lot of, you know, guidance and instructions. Um, in order to get started. I mean, the advantage for CAR-T is that, I mean, it's an apheresis procedure and it's very, very similar to peripheral blood stem cell collection. So if you already have an apheresis program and starting an apheresis program is a different question, right? But um, <laughs> if you have an apheresis program already, you really just need to tweak things a little bit in order to be able to start collecting CAR-T and then you would actually ship it to Novartis. So you don't have to do all that much with the product. Um, and then what happens is they, of course, uh, prepare the product and then they ship it back to your hospital for infusion um, to the patient. So I think that um, just making sure that you have um, all of the uh, compliance requirements for Novartis is the easiest way to get started. Now, jumping to doing clinical trials, of course, is going to be more complicated. Um, we have at least two clinical trials that we've recently started participating in, and one of the big steps for that has been the inspection by the clinical trial group. So they will come in, um, they will do kind of a mini, you know, it's, it's very similar to, it's not, it's not as scary or as intense as a fact inspection or a CAP inspection, right? And we are certified by CAP, AABB, JCO, uh, did I already say fact? Um, I mean, basically everything, like we get so many inspections. And um, so these don't scare us too much because uh, we're pretty used to inspections. Um, but, you know, the, the groups will come through, they'll give you the protocol, you would need to read through the protocol, make sure you're able to comply with all of the different timing, if there's different medications, if there's stimulation needed, if you're able to do that. Um, and then, um, make sure that you can support that program. And then they need to feel confident that you are able to do it as well. So part of that inspection will be like, yes, we feel that this facility is gonna be capable of enrolling the patient and acting quickly because sometimes the patient will show up very short time frame um, and getting that product to us. And most of these are gonna be manufactured offsite. So you just need to be able to have a, a good shipping process. Um, we are fortunate that we do have a new bioengineering lab at uh, on the, uh, Colorado, University of Colorado Anschutz Medical Campus, which is where Children's is located. Um, so we are going to start doing some manufacturing on site. So that's very exciting. Um, I think we've got some NK trials coming up too. Um, but, you know, overall, most of these products are just going to be shipped elsewhere. I think that uh, the last comment is very important. There were a lot of um, questions, in fact, in the chat about that, about manufacturing the product ourselves at the hospital or shipping them outside and both possibilities are okay and most of them are, most of us are going to ship the products somewhere else for the lab to manufacture the CAR-T uh, so we have to focus maybe on starting on the phases and doing the procedure and not in the whole process which is even more challenging maybe and I don't know if Dr. Matthews is with us. Uh, can you comment on the patient perspective from all of this uh, you have given a very good presentation about the other aspect that sometimes we neglect is not only the technical aspect and the medical ones, but also about how the patient feels about it. So what is important to, to share with the patient? Uh, what kind of um, maybe education or sometimes some written uh, test or how, how should 
we communicate with our patients about this whole and very uh, complex process. Dr. Matthews? There, yeah, I think there are, thank you. There are several aspects I think that are important. First is these patients have undergone several therapies um, typically in advance. So they're pretty savvy patients, um, but that means that they really recognize when we reuse materials. So while clinically this is similar for us to other therapies, for the patient experientially, it's very different. And so ensuring that all the information that we provide to them is targeted towards specifically CAR T cell therapy and gives them an idea of what's gonna happen is very important. I think also understanding that their caregiver is critical to this experience. And so there's someone with them all the time and, and understanding that both of them have needs in terms of education is, is very important. And then I think finally, ensuring that everyone is coordinated in the message that they provide. I don't think there are ever people who are trying to give a bad message, but I think at times because people are giving conflicting messages by accident, um, we wanna make sure that the information that's provided is very clear and very consistent. Um, and so patients feel like they can trust the system and trust our teamwork um, rather than just uh, discrete elements of education. Yeah, I think that's very important. Communication between the team, not also with the patient, but sharing the same messages. And maybe going back to Dr. Kai, there are a lot of questions about and maybe this that you talk about the efficiency of the collection itself. So, and they say, for example, if you can elaborate on the rough estimator to predict target CD30, CD3 dose, and if there is any mobilization required, and maybe the maximum number of efficiency settings permitted uh, in to reach the target CD3. So, Dr. Kai, can you maybe comment on how can we improve the collection process uh, in these patients? Dr. Kai? Yeah, yeah. so the, um, the, clin the, so the clinical algorithm or the, um, the rough predictor that I mentioned um, is a, well, it's an Excel file. It's an, um, and it's a mathematical equation that was developed based on the um, kind of average starting, you know, we, we had a number of patients to start with and um, some other hospitals shared some data. And so we kind of uh, had, you know, a certain number of patients where we could say, okay, based on this weight and this pre-CD3 CD3 count, we're very fortunate. We have an in-house flow lab that can give us a CD3 count within an hour. Um, and so we will get that free CD3 and we can look at that and say, um, and then use that to make a decision. Um, and I know you probably want me to give you more like of a mathematical formula for that, but I, I cannot just tell you the formula. Um, it's, it's a little beyond me, but, um, anyway, so we would, what we would do with that is we would put in the patient's weight, um, their known CD3 count. Um, and a couple of other details, and we would, uh, that will give us a prediction of how many blood volumes we need to collect based on our average collection efficiency um, as to get the goal, right? Now, you know, we have one of these for peripheral blood stem cell collection too, and I think we probably use it more for that one. Um, for CD3, because the um, recommendation is three total blood volumes, almost always just do three total blood volumes. Like the patient I just mentioned, the young man um, who had, uh, you know, had us have a second collection, even though uh, the prediction algorithm said we would get his goal in uh, one and a half, about one and a half blood volumes, we still just did three anyway, and we got more than enough. Um, you know, depending on, you know, if the patient's very unstable, we might stop early. Um, you know, once we're closer to that prediction. Um, and then we also, you know, might say, okay, well, we're a little bit low, right? We, we've got, you saw that our average total blood volumes is 3.1, right? Which means sometimes we go a little over. So the other thing that's really useful is we can look at it and say, okay, well, we're going to fall short of our goal of three total blood volumes um, by just a little bit. And if we feel that the patient can tolerate it, we may then extend it by half a blood volume or up to another blood volume. Um, and, you know, we can make those adjustments as we're going along. Um, and that may save the patient from a whole second day of the collection. So that's really the purpose in that. Like if we go a little bit longer today, we save them from having to be on the machine again tomorrow. I mean, these are little kids, right? They don't want to be on this machine. Um, yes. So 
uh, so we we that's mostly what we use a prediction algorithm for, and um, it's really the physician of the day. So the medical, the transfusion medical director is myself, and then the other transfusion medicine team. Um, we will kind of decide on a day to day basis if we want to vary at all um, based on that prediction algorithm. Because we have flow, we're also able to get a mid run. Um, so we can actually collect about midpoint for the procedure. Now remember that they become less efficient over time. So that first blood volume is going to give you the most cells, right? The most of your CD3, and then over time you're going to collect less efficiently. Um, so if you add more total blood volumes, you have to remember that you're going to be collecting less efficiently as you go along. Um, but at about the midpoint, we can collect a sample from the product and see what we've already got. And sometimes we'll know like, oh, we've got enough, you know, patient isn't tolerating this well, we can stop, you know, or we might be like, wow, we, we ended up much shorter than our prediction algorithm or it didn't work today. We need to go longer or we need to come back the next day. So those are kind of how we use that information. Um, you know, again, we're very fortunate. A lot of places don't have in-house flow um, that can give us a one hour turnaround time. Um, so I know that we, we have a kind of an, an extra, piece, uh, an extra tool in our toolkit that a lot of other places don't have. Um, but I think that, we, uh, that we've been able to really maximize the use of that opportunity. Okay. And this question is from, for Dr. Matthew. So do you have to prepare the facility, the, the center in some way? Do you have to have a special consideration to the place the patient is going to be uh, or something like, like this? this does this improve the, the patient uh, experience, as you mentioned in your, your talk, Dr. Matthews? Yeah, thank you. So our process was to bring everyone at the entire facility together to discuss the, the process from end to end. So people who are working in even logistics and receiving, people who are working in the lab, people working in the hospital, people working in the clinical setting, all sat together for two full days and we walked through the process from end to end. This was useful for several reasons. One was when something didn't go as expected, they knew exactly who to call uh, and how to understand what the problem was and understand the nuance of the issue that was, on, what, that was happening. Um, second, it helped them better explain to the patient what was going on. So when things kind of go behind the curtain and they go off in the mail or, you know, they go off to the lab, they can explain what's happening. They can talk about the person who's interacting with their cells. And so it became a very personal touch to them as well. And then finally, it really gave an opportunity for the team to discuss where redundancies existed um, or where conflicts were happening. And th so they'd say something like, oh, I didn't realize that you were doing that step too. So is this a step that we need to do twice or is this something that we can eliminate and make our process more efficient? So it was a, it was a process that we hadn't really used before to bring people from a very logistical side and then from a very clinical side together to discuss the end to end process, but it became very successful. And it really gave everyone on the team a sense of ownership over the process. So even if you're the person putting the shipping label on the, on the package at the end of the day, they were like, I'm part of this patient's care. So it was a very meaningful process for everyone. Thank you. And Dr. Kyle, and maybe we we'll with the last question. So um, there are some questions about the infusion. If the infusion is performed by the, if, by the, the team that performs the apheresis or the clinical team, and if you need any kind of mobilization prior to the apheresis procedure. Uh, can you comment on that, Dr. Kyle? Yeah, Dr. so um, the... Uh, CAR T collections are non-mobilized, um, which I think is nice for patients because, you know, GCSF does have some uncomfortable side effects, you know, the majority being bone pain. Um, and it's also nice, I think, because they can then kind of schedule their day. So for CAR T, we can say you're showing up on Thursday, right? You're getting your lines in the morning, we're doing your collection, um, you know, and then we have Friday in case we have to go three days, we never had to go more than three days. Um, whereas stem cell, you know, we're checking every morning that CD34 count to say, or have you reached the threshold for us to go ahead and collect? So it is, I think, nice in that it's unmobilized. And so there's fewer side effects initially, right? There's CAR T side effects for the infusion itself. Um, now the transfusion medicine team or aphresis team does just the collection component. So we, um, we will go see the patient. We will consent 
them. We will explain the procedure. Um, we will oversee the procedure um, with our apheresis nurses, and then we kind of send them on their way. Um, and the product is then processed um, wherever it's being processed, depending on the um, company or the uh, protocol. And then uh, the reinfusion does occur, uh, the patient is readmitted, and then the infu infusion does occur on the uh, hematology floor, and it is overseen by our bone marrow transplant team. So those are primarily hematologists. I'm not actually very involved in the um, the side of the infusion process. I know we have had a few patients that have had some pretty severe cytokine release syndrome, which is one of the big side effects for RT. Um, some of them do have some neurological sequelae. That's another common um, side effect. Um, we did have one patient who got had such severe cytokine release syndrome that they developed a uh, TAM off. And then we got called in to perform therapeutic apheresis after we had already done CAR T. So uh, that was a, a patient and that, that patient actually had very severe um, liver toxicity too. So we had citrate, um, citrate lock on him, which was very challenging. Um, but uh, so we, we very, but we very rarely end up really hearing about what happens uh, to these patients other than in passing. We do of course have a really great relationship with BMT and with uh, our own stem cell processing lab. Um, we have an in-house processing lab. And so, um, you know, we do have a quality review and we discuss the patient. So we kind of hear that they had an infection or they had cytokine release syndrome, but we're not intimately involved with the management of that aspect. I think that's very important what you mentioned, especially if we're going to start doing this program or procedures in our centers to, to, be, to be trained in safety. This is usually related to the clinical team, to the bone marrow transplantation team, uh, but it's important to, to, be, to know how to manage, especially cytokine release syndrome with esteroids, tomsilizumab, or whatever we have at our clinic, but that's very important. So I don't know if the chair have any other question from Dr. For, uh, do you have any other question, or maybe we can close this meeting? Claudia? I have, I have just the last question. Dr. Kai, okay. would you want to comment on the relapse rate after a CAR T therapy? <laughs> oh. That's a very complicated question. <laughs> that, that, I, is a, yeah. that is a good question. And you know what? For our facility, I don't have exact numbers. Um, you know, I do know. I mean, I can tell you of the three patients I presented, one of them is doing great. One of them is, you know, just getting their second CAR T because the first one failed. And one of the patients did great after CAR T and survived for at least two years. And then I know the patient is now deceased, but I don't know why. Um, so I think it's a mix. And I think the other challenge too is when you're looking at CAR T, you know, you're using this on uh, you know, relapse patients versus using it as bridge to transplant. Um, and I think you're going to get very different data and different confounders between those two. So I don't have like an exact, it's 66% or something. I don't have that number for you. Um, but I mean, uh, certainly the evidence is that it's, um, you know, that it is a beneficial therapy and that it does work. I know some of the some of the research reports say that it's up to 80% effective, um, but I don't have those numbers specifically for my institution. I think it also depends on the indication of the CAR T, uh, if it's ALL or other diseases. And there are a lot of development about uh, this uh, CAR T cell persistence, CAR T cell failure, and um, different CAR T. So maybe we can have another meeting about all these new advancements in CAR T cell therapy. Uh, so we are going to close this meeting and we are going to kindly request our two speakers to just uh, briefly um, provide the, the key messages to take home after this session, which is, which are the most important topics that we have discussed today. What do you think? So I'm going to start with Dr. Kyle. Um, I would say the most important uh, consideration, you know, if you're going to develop CAR T therapy is, you know, to make sure that your apheresis team is uh, comfortable with the process um, and to, uh, you know, really look at your numbers and figure out how to have a really good collection efficiency to minimize the amount of time the patient has to be on the machine um, and to minimize the side effects. And Dr. Matthews, from the patient perspective and building a strong team 
for CAR T cell therapy, what do you think are the most important messages to take home? Yeah, I think uh, as this is an incredibly complex process um, that involves several different teams, I think being able to create a consistent message and to not underestimate the experience that the patients are having, um, as well, even though it's life-saving and wonderful, it can still be a very challenging period for patients. So uh, have a very empathetic approach and a very consistent approach. Claudio, do you want to give the final, um, the final words be before closing the meeting? Okay, first of all, thank you for all of you. It was a very relevant uh, webinar. Probably we have uh, in our hands in the near future, uh, many clinical trials using the dual CAR-T cells for uh, having promising results. Like, you know, for example, in a multiple myeloma using the CD19 and the BCMA or in ALL or lymphoma, the CD19 uh, and CD22. Uh, for instance, we have a lot of um, opportunities for avoid the CAR T cell barriers like the severe toxicities, the antigen escape, the <laughs> tumor infiltration, uh, especially in solid tumors, you know, and the modest anti tumor activity also. But well, we have in our hands, uh, in, in our case in Latin America, uh, we don't have up to now experience in CAR T cells but it's coming in, in the near future, I, I guess. Uh, all of you, thank you so much for participating today, especially to our main speakers, Kyle and Alison, and of course, Natalia, for your uh, exceptional uh, mentor activity. Thank you so much for all the audience. And of course, in the name of the ATAM uh, clinical activities in CT, uh, thank you. Thank you so much. And see you in the next webinar. Thank you, all of you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you for all of you.